Well, good morning, Cross Point. Hey, the sun must be shining because you guys are right on it today. Wasn't it great to wake up this morning and see the sun shining instead of that liquid sunshine falling and then to actually have the temperature like above three? So it was terrific. We're so gl <laughs> glad you're here. Can you tell I'm done with winter? I'm Pastor Pencil. We're so glad you're here today, either worshiping with us in person or online. Special treat for you today. Pastor Adam is going to be sharing with us today, and you are going to have your socks blessed right off. I wore my Argyle socks just to get them blessed off today. Day, all right, so it's going to be a great, great morning in God's house. Let's take a look at our mission area of the week. Our mission area of the week is, of course, our good friends from the Philippines, uh, Greg Lyons. Uh, Greg, I tell you, he is going to be speaking with us during our missions conference this year. And if you've never heard Greg Lyons speak, you are in for a treat. Just buckle up and be really, really caffeinated and also hydrated because when he preaches, it is high energy and ready to rumble. All right? And so he's got some praises. He is praising God for what is going on through Global Surge. They've had more than 127,000 baptisms since they began the ministry. Can you believe that? 127,000. Their Baptist Bible College in Asia is now called Global Life University. They're launching their presence beyond the Philippines. Campuses are opening in Pakistan, Cambodia, Thailand, Kenya, and in the USA. They currently have 2,600 students, so praise the Lord for that. And here's a couple of prayer requests for the Lions. We need, they need $15,000 to establish ministry platforms in Thailand and in Cambodia to provide unlimited visas for Asian missionaries. And finally, pray for the building process in Pakistan. They have a property and the funds for the building. Did you get that? In Pakistan, just working through the government documents to build. So if you would pray for those things for the Lions, I know they'd appreciate it so very much. Let's take a look. If you'd stand with me, we're going to look at our verse of the week. We're going to do the... Reference, the scripture, the reference, the scripture, the reference. All right, here we go. Hebrews eleven six. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Hebrews eleven six. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Let's ask God's presence together this morning. Father God, we thank you for your love for us. God, we thank you that you are here amongst us today. For those that are watching online, perhaps some folks still not feeling well, God, we pray that you'll bless them. Lord, will you just again unite our hearts together because we're so grateful that the foot of the cross is level. And today, as we hear your word proclaimed, God, again, we don't want to just be hearers of the word, but God, help us to take it, to apply it to our lives so we can be better equipped to go out there and connect with people and to change your kingdom for Jesus' sake. Bless Pastor Adam this morning. Bless the team behind me, God, as they lead us in singing this morning, God. Every note that's played, every note that is sung, may it bring honor and glory to you. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. You guys ready to sing this morning?
Jesus Christ, my living hope. 
every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Isn't it awesome? We serve a God this morning that breaks every chain. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. You may be seated. The ushers are going to be coming forward to receive our morning tithes and offerings. If, if you are new with us, please do not give. We are just so glad that you are here. But if you are new or are newer to our church, if you don't mind, in the back seat in front of you, you will see a connect card, a welcome card. If you can fill that out for us, just let us know that you are here. We would love to connect with you. And, and for everyone in this room, uh, on the back side of that connect card, there's a prayer request card that you can fill out prayer requests. We pray for each and one of the prayer requests that are filled out every single Tuesday morning because we know prayer is the only way that we can survive. It's through God and His doing. Even if you want to write anonymous on that prayer, please let us know what is going on in your lives. We will pray for you. The worship team is going to have one more song and, and feel free to be seated. But as, as they go through this song, I just, just want you to reflect on the words this morning. Be able to think through how God is, is moving and working in your life. And so as the worship team plays, let us, let us dwell on these things this morning.
thank you so much that our heart is yours. May we be after you, Lord. Please work in our hearts, our souls, and our minds that we can give it all to you each and every day. Just worry about today is what you tell us. Be with us, Lord. I pray that you just open our ears to hear your message. Be with Pastor Adam. And this we pray in your name. Amen. A building always starts with a foundation. Our faith is the same way. There are things in our faith that are foundational. They are the basics, the fundamentals, the essentials. They are cornerstones and building blocks. Now built together, they form our faith and understanding of God. Built together, they are solid, strong, and resilient. But when you try to remove things from our faith, to alter them, to distort them, to deny them, things begin to get shaky. Our faith and our understanding become weakened. And if enough things are removed, it can eventually collapse. And this is why it's so important to know what we believe. Well, good morning. This morning, I want to bring you back to memory lane. I want to bring you back in time this morning. For some of you, this uh, take back to memory lane over these two, three year span, um, some of you enjoyed this time. I'm going to imagine 95 to maybe 99% of, of the people in this room are going to hate me for bringing this up, but I'm going to anyway. I'm going to drag you back to memory lane. I want to bring you back to middle school. <laughs> oh, I, I heard it. Middle school. And, you know, I understand for some of you, you didn't get the wonderful experience or the full experience of middle school like some of the rest of us did. So just to give you a delightful taste of this experience, or uh, maybe just even help you recall your memory of some of the things that you've blocked out for many years, I thought I'd take you back. And uh, the way that I'm going to do that is introduce you to my friend Greg here. Greg might look a little bit familiar to you because he actually is pretty famous. He, he was originally, there was a book written about him and then made to a movie, and that movie is called Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And in this movie, the main premise is that Greg is in middle school. He's starting middle school, and he has one goal. I just want to fit in. I just want to be considered cool. But the problem is with, with Greg here is that he finds that there are many challenges to middle school that are unique to any other part of life. The first, and, and help me recall in some of these as well, is body changes and insecurities. You know, puberty is pretty cruel. And uh, to some of us, uh, you grow six feet tall at age 12. And then there are others that God has stunted their growth, as you see by the discrepancies in this photo. And then there's uh, what I like to call uh, teenage leprosy kicks in, also known as acne. And, and let us not forget about braces. How many of you had, had braces? Not as many as I thought there would be. There, so there's individuals that, you know, they had perfect teeth and others, they had metal in their mouth for years, right? And, and so this is uh, one of those fun, fun times. So personally, it's a, it's a problem, and you're obviously trying to perceive how others view you based off of your looks, right? But it goes further than that. There's also familial problems, specifically parental problems, right? There's parents cramping out our style, Right. Because there's, there's kind of this dynamic of when you enter middle school, you're at that stage where you're really desiring independence, but you're so dependent on the support of your parents that you have to stick around with them. And the problem with the parents is that they're, they're, they still see their teenager as this little boy or girl. And, and so they're going to treat them that way still. But of course, the 
the kid doesn't like that either. And so there's some symptoms to that. For example, like your, your mom calling you sweetie pie in front of all your friends. That's embarrassing, just to let you know. That's embarrassing to do that in front of all of his friends. Or in this example, as you see, uh, the mom volunteers for, uh, to help out at the school dance that Greg was going to when Greg was begging her not to go, right? So it's, it's not only personal problems, it's not only familial problems, there's, there's also, the, then you actually enter the middle school doors, right? So we, ha- we haven't even gotten to the middle school yet. And it's there that we start to learn about the unwritten rules of middle school, at least in terms of being cool and popular. And that uh, there's unwritten rules as to the clothes you wear. There's unwritten rules about the extracurriculars you get involved in. What you say and definitely what you don't say is part of these rules. And all the, and there's more to be able to share with this, but to all these factors, the personal, the family, the, the entering the middle school, all this culminate and many others and, and result in your middle school identity. And that middle school identity is how other, view, other middle schoolers view you. And so all, if you really wanna know where you land on this middle school coolness scale, you'll have to go to the epicenter of social life. And that is the middle school lunchroom. And it is here in the middle school lunchroom that groups are formed, cliques emerge, like people with like middle school identities colliding. Cool kids with cool kids, nerds with nerds, and everybody, every category in between sit with their like social groups. And really there's no little, there's little crossover. And so it is here that Greg stands with his cafeteria tray. You remember those, those massive cafeteria trays with all the cafeteria food? And he looks out at a sea filled with middle school students just praying and hoping that he can find a social group that he can belong in. And you know, it's, it's interesting when I look at this picture and, and it kind of concerns me sometimes because Sometimes I don't see much of a difference between this picture and this one. Do you? Because for, for some in this room, maybe, maybe you're newer or, or maybe you've been here for a long time and you've really never felt like you fit in here. And then there's others on the opposite side of the spectrum who, who found their, their, their church cliques and they really don't want to branch out at all. And so I want to talk to, to really both of these groups this morning. I want to try and, and get this in our church to go away. But I'll need your help. And, and last week we started a new series on uh, what we're calling faith in the 21st century. Sounds pretty explanatory, right? Uh, what does faith look like in today's age? And today, I want to talk through what faith doesn't look like. We talked about what faith looked like through Zacchaeus last week. I want to talk about what it doesn't look like this morning. And the way that I'm going to do this is that I want to invite you to the middle school lunchroom of first century Palestine. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, we'll be looking at verses 9 through 13. Matthew 9, 9 to 13 says this. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus' popularity is increasing by the day. 
If you, if you did a survey, uh, just flip one page over, Matthew 8, 9, just kind of skim through that, you'll notice that there's a lot of things that Jesus is doing that to, to the public is really well. He's, he's healing many people. He's, he's bringing people to himself. There's plenty of miracles happening, and people are clinging to him. And he just finished healing a paralytic, and the coolest man in town walks through the town and he sees a man. And this man, we'll, we'll get to in a second, but what I, what I want you to realize is that, I just wanna stop at, he saw a man. The, the thing is, whether we realize it or not, you are constantly interviewing people. From the first time you set eyes on people, in fact, you can look around in this room and you are automatically creating a perception of who you believe that person to be. And that's why we talk about first impressions, because you're immediately judging their character, their personality, their looks, their, uh, their status in society, and ultimately you are trying to decide, deci- yeah, you're trying to decide whether you desire to associate with them or not. Jesus sees a man, and this man's name is Matthew. Some of you may have seen The Chosen before. It's, it's a big series going out right now about the disciples of Jesus. And for those that have watched the show, um, I don't know about you, I kind of root for Matthew. Uh, I, I like Matthew. Uh, you know, he, he's a quirky t- character that, you know, gets picked on by the disciples and you just really just want him to fit in, you know. But if you are an Israelite in In Jesus' day, you hate Matthew. Hate him. And you hate him for two reasons. The first is the most obvious thing uh, that many of you know already is that you realize that Matthew is a tax collector. And I don't want to spend too much time on this. You probably know all the semantics of this. But, But Matthew works for Israel's oppressive enemy, Rome. And Matthew is contracted to collect heavy Roman taxes. For the Israelites. So imagine, I want you to imagine yourself as an Israelite. You are slaving away at your job just and, and for your family, just to make sure that you can put food on the table, only to realize that a hefty, um, a huge chunk of your finances go not only to your most hated enemy, but also to Matthew, who is collecting those taxes and he's living off of the taxes that he, you just gave him and he's a pretty well-off guy. How would you feel? I'd be pretty ticked off. They hate Matthew. But it, but it actually gets worse, you see, because when you dig a little deeper into Matthew, if you look at some of the other accounts that go through this calling of Matthew, you see that he's actually called a different name in those accounts. What's the name? The name is Levi. Matthew's name is Levi. Now there's many different theories on why they call him Levi and some and Matthew and others, but really that's beside the point. What you need to realize is that for people in the first century, parents didn't just pick out cute names because they sounded good. People picked out names with significance. They picked names that had hopes that their baby would resemble the name that was picked out for them. So if you're any Israelite in that time, when you think of the name Levi, you are automatically brought back to the Old Testament. You are brought back to the Levitical priests whose job, special privilege really, was of maintaining and preserving the worship of God for Israel. So Levi, or Matthew, it wasn't only that he was Jewish. It wasn't only even that he was a traitor against his own people. But it was also the fact that he had high spiritual expectations. When you have a name like that, you're expected to live a certain way. And so we see that not only did he not live up to those spiritual expectations... But he ended up using his mathematical gifts and abilities to actually stick it to his own country 
work for the opposing team and get selfish gain off of it. People hate Matthew. The, the, um, I don't know if some of you are football people. The NFL draft has been going on where, where college players are picked for professional teams. And one of the things that's discussed is that, you know, a lot of these players, they have great promise of being these great athletes. But what happens after a couple of years is that if they don't live up to that promise, they're titled a name called a bust. Matthew is the spiritual bust of Israel. He is hated. In their eyes, he is a failure. And you know what? The Israelites aren't necessarily wrong about Matthew. He, in, in this, when you read his context, his story, he is a spiritual failure. And if you're Matthew, you're sitting alone, you're sitting in that tax collector's booth, you've made all those decisions in life, and you wonder if they were the right ones. You ever feel that sometimes, where you made decisions in the past and you're looking at it now and, man, maybe I messed up on those. You reflect on every single decision that you've ever made in your life. I'm, I'm confident that Matthew's doing this, all the mistakes he's ever made, and reflected on what he should have been as Levi and what he really is now. And I bet he's also wondering if God would ever forgive him for those choices. And how interesting is it that God comes on the scene in verse 9, that Jesus comes in. And you know what? It's, it's even worse when Jesus comes in because he doesn't even know, or he, he not only knows the, the background, like he knows what he's done in the past, he also knows his heart motives. So, so Jesus sees him even worse than he actually is. And, and Jesus has every right to either, like everybody else, just kind of push him off, or even just rebuke him in front of everybody, because he deserves it. And yet, Jesus sees his pain, his brokenness, and invites him in. Verse 9, we see that Jesus says, follow me. This invitation is twofold. First, Jesus invites Matthew into a life of purpose. Some of you might be looking for purpose this morning. He does this for Matthew. And I don't know about you, like when when I read this account, you know, this is, I'm helping remind you, this is Matthew's gospel, okay? So this is his time to shine, to be able to write out these massive paragraphs about how Jesus changed him, how he entered his life, how, you know, the wretched sinner that he was before, and how, how many verses does he actually spend on this account of him being called? One verse. <laughs> One verse. Jesus literally says two words. And you know what? For Matthew, that's all he needed. That's all he needed. Because of all the decisions that he has ever made and ever pursued. He pursued the wealth, he pursued the comfort, he pursued the security, and none of it satisfied like he'd hope. And here comes Jesus with this simple invitation for a fresh start. Maybe we need a fresh start this morning. Because Jesus calls us to this exact same purpose with these exact same two words, follow me. And you know, that, that follow me, that, that life of purpose, it might look different for all of us in terms of how we pursue that purpose. But boy, isn't it more satisfying to pursue Jesus' purpose over our own? Jesus calls us into lives of purpose. But, you know, it, it always bothered me, especially growing up, because you, you might be thinking, I know I've thought this before, does Jesus really want to be with me? Like, who I am right now? Like, the, the sinner that I am? Like, like, he knows me, but does he really want to be with me? Or does he just want to be with some better, 
you know, future holier version of me? Does he just want that person in the future or does he actually want me? Or even worse, is Jesus just using me for my obedience that just do all the tasks that he wants me to do or does he just want me? And this is where the second invitation comes in. Jesus isn't just calling you into a life of purpose, but he's calling you into a life of relationship with him. Look at verse 10 with me. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, stop. I know there's more to the verse, but I want you to stop just for a minute. You see that behold? I want you to look at your Bibles for a minute. Some Bibles, they don't use this word behold. In fact, they actually avoid using it because in American language, it's kind of an awkward word. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't use behold in sentences. I don't know about you. Maybe you do. I don't. And uh, if, if you look at the Greek word behind the behold, you realize that it's supposed to function as like a, a drum roll for a grand announcement. It's supposed to prepare you for a punchline that's going to occur in the next phrase. This shocking moment that's supposed to reveal. Okay? So let's, let's rewind and, and prepare for the shocking moment. Okay? So, and as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold... Many tax collectors and sinners came, and they were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. It's at this point that you're supposed to do the, the gasp. I put that in there as, there you go. For, for many of us, this is kind of anticlimactic, isn't it? Because we, we know generally what Jesus does, and, and that sounds pretty spot on to what Jesus already does already. It seems kind of normal. But in Jesus' day, this is incredibly countercultural. And in fact, if we were to apply it to today's time, we would even say it's countercultural. Let me bring you back to middle school for a minute. So, cool kids don't sit with the lower social groups. You know why? Because if a cool kid hangs out with a lower social group kid, there's the potential of them being ousted from their own cool social group. Get that? That's why I talked about cool kids cool, sit with cool kids and nerds sit with nerds, other categories with other categories, right? And we look at Jesus. His popularity is rising day by day, and it's as if he is purposefully, intentionally trying to diminish his own reputation right in front of everybody by sitting with these tax collectors and sinners. Do you catch that? This is countercultural. You're not supposed to sit with these low lifers. That, that's, that's what we're going to see in a minute that some people feel. And, and Jesus is willing to risk his own reputation. He is willing to risk how he's viewed by the public so he can hang out and have relationship with those people. And that's where the hope comes in. Jesus isn't just looking to use you for his purposes, though he will use you for his purposes. He desires to be in relationship with you the way you are right now. And that is incredibly comforting for someone that just feels lost and broken and has felt like they've messed up all of their life. Jesus wants to be with you, and he wants to be with you now. The question is, do you believe that this morning? That's another question. And you'll have to decide that for yourself. Now for everyone at the table, I was, as I was mentioning, this doesn't make sense at all. And we see that there are two middle school responses that come out at the dinner table, table that actually sadly reflect a lot of our churches. And might even reflect this one too. Let's look at verse 11. First is the response of the Pharisees. And when the Pharisees saw this, saw Jesus sitting with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And from a social and cultural standpoint, they are right. Teachers don't stoop down to those people or, you know, and, and what the Pharisees would be thinking, the slum of the earth. And, and I mean, if Anyone should be sitting at the table of Jesus. 
at least in the Pharisees' minds, it should be them. They are the ones that are worthy to sit at the table with Jesus. And, you know, I, when I read this verse, I read their question. I don't know about you, I just feel like this sick, disgusted taste in my mouth. Like, how dare you say that to them, right? That's just so wrong. That, that is so pompous. That is so elitist of a demeanor. And then if I think about it a little bit more, the truth is I, I know I need to look in the mirror, and maybe you do too. When we first come to Jesus, we are the Matthews of the earth. Do you realize that? That, that we, when we come to Jesus, we, we view ourselves as Matthews, as sinful tax collectors that are just grateful that God was gracious and merciful towards us. Like, do you remember that when you were first saved, that you were just radically transformed by the gospel and, and you just wanted, you were just so grateful for what Jesus did for you. And, and you hung out with anybody that you could because you didn't know any better. And you know what happens over time though, is that we start to get more involved in small groups. We, we start to know the Bible more and spend more time in, in prayer and Bible reading, and we start to do more service opportunities here at, at the church. And what happens subtly, if we're not aware of it, is that we start to build up our own spiritual self-esteem. It rises and rises and to the point where we actually start comparing our own ministry involvement, our walk with God. Heck, even even the comparing other people's personal problems and just boosting our ego that we look like we are we are the better christians compared to everybody else we rank each other isn't that what the pharisees are doing yeah we do the same thing and we get to the point where you know we see uh, people that don't look like us in church or wherever, or even just new people in general. And, you know, we, we don't bad talk them, but we definitely avoid them. And so, we see a problem. The, the thing is, you only talk to your friend groups here. And, and can I ask you something? Is, is church really supposed to be this way? Like, like really? Is this church... Because if it is, I really don't want to be part of it. And, and there's a reason why a lot of people outside of this building that don't come to church, don't come to church. Because they have that same exact perception of the church. They're elitist, they're pompous, they're Pharisees. But sadly, that's not the only middle school response, or lack thereof. Who did the Pharisees ask the question to? Look at your Bibles. Who did they ask the question to? The disciples, you're right. Who answered the question? Jesus, yeah, not the disciples, right? The disciples were supposed to answer the question, and they didn't. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting. It, it could have been one of those scenarios where Jesus was just really ready to just throw the verbal punch at the Pharisees. That could have been. But can I ask you something? If, if Jesus wasn't in the picture, do you think the disciples would be at the dinner table right now with tax collectors and sinners? No. I don't think so. I, I very sincerely doubt it. And, you know, I, I, the reason I think they don't give a response to the Pharisees is because they still don't know why they're doing it. I don't think they want to be there. And the reality is, is that the disciples have the exact same mindset as the Pharisees. Do you realize that? They have the exact same mindset because they, they think of themselves, the disciples think of themselves as still better than the tax collectors and sinners. The only difference is, is that they are sitting with them at the table and the Pharisees aren't. That is the only difference. And sadly, I, I think this is how probably most church people actually operate. They, they do it because it's the right thing to do. But can I, can I ask you something? Just because you do the right thing, does that mean you have the right heart behind it? No. The disciples really don't care about these people. They're just following orders. 
They just want to look good in Jesus' eyes. And I, I really do believe, believe this is how church, churchgoers, most churchgoers respond. They outwardly, uh, you know, they're outwardly nice. They hang out with a tax collector every, you know, every once in a while because they know the Bible says to do that kind of thing. But they don't really care about them. They definitely don't love them and they would rather be anywhere else. So, what I want to ask this morning is, from these two middle school responses, where are you? How do you respond? Do you respond, uh, how do you respond here at church, you know, with, with other church people? How do you respond with your family, especially the ones that seem more awkward? Or, or maybe people at work. Who do you try and disassociate yourselves from or hang out with them because it's nice, but I don't really care for them? I just wonder what in, the, what in the world is wrong with our hearts. Like, how, how do we get this way? We were, we were once tax collectors and sinners, saved by grace, and then we've turned into these monsters, spiritual monsters. What happened? And I think there's two responses that Jesus gives as solutions. Things to help us evaluate who we really are and how we please God. The first is how we please God. Jesus wants to evaluate how we please God because he thinks that we have it wrong. Look at verse 13. He, I'll skip back to 12 in a minute. He says, this is Jesus refer, talking to the Pharisees after their question. He says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The first heart problem is that we have a wrong view of how to please God. Jesus gives the Pharisees this simple homework assignment. And they were the teachers, but and they, they gave the homework assignments. Now Jesus is giving the homework assignment. And, and this verse is quoted from, I put the reference there, from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. If you don't know much about Hosea, he's the guy, the Old Testament prophet, who God told to marry a promiscuous woman who was going to commit adultery on him over and over again, but he was supposed to go back to her every, you know, anyway, over and over and over again. You remember him now? And, and so... That's kind of the context, and, and we see that the marriage is supposed to symbolize Old Testament Israel's uh, constant adultery against God, and so God continues to love and pursue Israel anyway, and is faithful to her anyway. And it's in Hosea 6 that God is actually condemning Israel's worship. And it, it's, you know, the problem is, is that they're sacrificing, you know, to to God, they're sacrificing to, you know, because they know that it's the right thing to do, but they miss the whole point of worship in itself. And that purpose is to experience and know the living God that you're actually worshiping. It means nothing in here if you come and sing praises to God every Sunday, but there is no heart or desire to experience God in the midst of it. If you're just sacrificing, then it's empty. It's pointless. And so Jesus quotes this passage, this verse, for the Pharisees as a warning. Because they are in danger of the same trap that the Israelites were in Hosea's day. What were the Pharisees missing? They were so focused on their religious piety, their own spiritual standing, that they completely miss the whole heart of God, that he is gracious and merciful to the sinner, that he has come compassionately to save them. They completely miss it. They make it more about them than it is about God and his people. And it's at this moment that the disciples better be listening because they're just one step behind the Pharisees. They are doing things out of obedient sacrifice to Jesus. They, they know it's the right thing to do. But they're doing it as a sacrifice. They don't desire it out of recognizing that those tax collectors and sinners received the same mercy that I did. And as Christians, we often are so 
We're just so focused on our intellectual knowledge and, and we're just so focused on studying God's word and, and those are good things and we're so focused on, and on our service in other ministries and that's all good things but the problem is when you have the wrong heart to do it. Jesus wants us to know that we have a wrong view of how to please God. But it's not just that. He also wants to know that we have a wrong view of who we are. We have a wrong view of who we are. Go back to verses 12 and 13 again. But when he, referring to Jesus, heard this, referring to their question, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. You'll see that from my slide here that I made sure to underline certain things and, and bold certain things. And you're supposed to see the connections between the two verses. And so Jesus wants to bring you to the doctor's office. Okay? There's two people that enter the doctor's office. One is well, seems like there's no problems at all. The other is deathly ill and needs treatment immediately. Who is the physician going to heal? This guy, he's going he's to heal the one that's really sick and that needs a doctor immediately. And Jesus takes this illustration into the spiritual realm, specifically into his spiritual mission on earth, that Jesus is the physician. He makes all people spiritually well through him, okay? And then we see that the, the, the well people right here, the, that connects with the righteous people, and we're supposed to perceive those individuals as the Pharisees. And we're supposed to perceive that the sick people are the sinners, that Jesus' mission wasn't to come to the righteous people, the, the Pharisees, but it was to come to the sick sinner. And if you're the Pharisees, you're really upset because you thought that if, if he truly was the Messiah, he would cling to them, the people that got, have gotten it right since day one. And yet Jesus goes to the screw-ups. But the Pharisees are missing one crucial, important point. Rewind the doctor's visit scenario, and I'm going to add a twist. Two people are deathly ill. They need to go to the doctor's office. One goes to the doctor's office, the other doesn't. Why does the one that doesn't, why doesn't he go, and why does the person that does go, go? It's your perception of yourself. If you are, and I've done this before physically, where I'll say that I'm fine physically, yet I am really ill. And there's people that like that, that, that they really have hours to live. They need treatment now, but they're not going to go anyway. And then there's others that realize that they need to go to the doctor now or, or something bad's going to happen. Do you see the connection Jesus takes this into the spiritual realm and he says that those Pharisees that think they are this, that think they are righteous, are actually this. They're incredibly sick. They need a doctor, yet they don't care for one. The Pharisees don't see themselves rightly. In fact, even the disciples don't even see themselves rightly. The only people that see themselves rightly in this passage, other than Jesus, are Matthew and the tax collectors and sinners. That's it. And it is only when you realize that you are not this, when you are actually sick, when you are a wretched sinner, that it is that you are in desperate need of saving, that ultimately revolutionizes the way that you read Hosea 6.6. 6. Because you realize how gracious and merciful God has been to you when you never even deserved it, and there's nothing that you could do to make, you, make your relationship with Jesus any better. You couldn't fix the problem, but somebody else could. 
And it's only when you go to the physician, when you only go to Jesus, that you realize who you are, how much you need him, and then it revolutionizes how you see everybody else in the room. Right? Because when I realize that I'm actually the tax collector, that I'm the sinner, then I actually don't see my, I don't try and compare myself and think I'm better than you. I think I am just as worse, if not worse, than you. And it's only, this, this, this can only be done through the gospel power of Jesus. There is no other way. And so this morning, as we reflect on these things, I want to bring you one last time to the middle school lunchroom. And my question for you is that in this church lunchroom, where are you sitting? Are you sitting with the Pharisees? Have you been purposefully avoiding fellow churchgoers or even avoiding people who don't look like you? Do you find yourself constantly evaluating yourselves amongst other people to boost your own self-esteem? Or do you even see yourselves as the disciples? I know the right thing to do, to hang out with those tax collectors and sinners, those people that are beneath me, but I really don't care for them. I definitely don't love them, and I'm just doing it because Jesus said so. If If you're in one of these Groups, if you're sitting at the table with these groups this morning, I beg you, repent. Repent of your sins. We don't talk about repentance very much. It sounds like we're asking too much. I'm asking you to do what you should already know that you are. Repent to realize that you are the sinner and how you have wronged other people. But I want you to also realize that God is gracious and merciful to you. He, he doesn't just want you to be brought low, but he wants to raise you up to realize the mercy of God and be reminded of who you are. That you are the wretched sinner, yes. That you are sick, but you have been saved by a physician, and his name is Jesus. And then there are those this morning that feel like Matthew. Matthew. Have you mis- made mistake after mistake in your life? Have, are you looking for a greater purpose in life? Are you looking for a fresh start? Are you looking for a do-over? I can't promise you a do-over in life, but I'll tell you what, Jesus provides a fresh start. He provides a new calling, a new way to follow him, to have new life in him. He doesn't beat you over the head with rebukes. Rather, he invites you into this new life where you are not focused on your own selfish gain, but you are truly satisfied in in Jesus who was the one that was there in the beginning that knew you, that was there in the creation of you, and who truly loves you for who you are. Do you need a fresh start? If so, Come to the middle school, room, or middle school table of Jesus. He's always got a seat open. And renew your life to him. Let's pray together. God, I am a wretched sinner. Ah. Uh, People in this room, they they don't know how much of a wretched sinner I am. In fact, I don't even realize the extent of my own sin, but you do. And yet, despite of that, you have faithfully pursued me and loved me anyway, and you have called me and everyone else in this room to follow you. Yet, over time, as we've grown in the church and learned more about you, our hearts have grown calloused towards other people, that we have viewed other people wrong, that we have viewed our own worship of you wrong, that we focus more on sacrifices, more on the merciful grace of God, and, and we really have not loved you. We have not realized who we are. 
God, this morning, would you put our minds and hearts into perspective? Would you lead us to humility? That God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. This morning, would you humble us? Would you convict us? Would you re- help us repent? And would you lead us to a fresh start? A start where we sit at your table and feast with you. God, we love you. We thank you. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen.